Good evening, everybody. And if there's anybody away in the back that might want to move up, we're going to have some open seats here, and it might be easier to hear you if you have any questions. My name is Lance Grandy, and I'm Senior Vice President and Head of Research and Collections at the Field Museum. And I'm also a member of the C2SD board and um, also chair of the programming committee for that board. We are uh, very interested in uh, knowing how you feel about tonight's program. And so I hope you will take the cards that you received when you came in, uh, fill them out, and give them to a staff member on your way out this evening. That helps us gauge your interest in the topics that we're providing and just the, basically the way we're running the show here. Today's topic is oceans health. We have two leading marine scientists from the Shedd Aquarium with us, Alan LaPont and Cassia Perpich. They're both going to discuss problems of ocean acidification and, and um, or problems of the ocean acidification and commercial fishing and uh, what we as consumers can do to probably or to possibly help this, help prevent it. Alan LaPointe is Vice President of Environmental Quality for the Shedd Aquarium. He has a bachelor's degree in zoology and chemistry from Southern Illinois University and an MBA from the University of Phoenix. He's conducted various water quality seminars for zoological organizations and taught various courses in water chemistry. As part of the aquarium's conservation efforts, this year he'll begin fieldwork in Guyana, researching the water quality, plants, and animals in one of the last untouched aquatic systems of the world. Cassia Perpich oversees Right Bite, the award-winning sustainable seafood program at the aquarium. She has a master's degree in public policy from Indiana University, and she works closely with Chicago's restaurant community to build demand for seafood that's either caught or farmed in eco-friendly ways. Passionate about sustainable food production, Cassia also brings her expertise to a number of organizations, including Slow Food Chicago, the Green Chicago Restaurant Coalition, and the Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions. So this evening, each speaker will talk for about 20 minutes or so, and after both speakers are finished, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. And on that note, Alan LaPointe will start things off, and I'll turn it over to you, Alan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me out there? Good. Um, I'm going to start us out on uh, talking about a, a, a phenomenon that's going on in the oceans. Uh, it's been termed ocean acidification. It's not my my choice on the term nor on the definition, and I'll tell you why. Um, but this is real. This is happening, and uh, many of you probably have never heard of it. Uh, some of you may have heard of this a little bit because it is starting to get in the press. The definition of ocean acidification is an ongoing decrease in the pH in the oceans caused by the uptake of human-caused carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So basically, uh, and, and I'm not crazy about the definition. I'll tell you why. I think the definition, to me, reminds me of the greenhouse effect. You know, we talked about greenhouse effect and all these things, and then everybody debated it, and it went on and on. And then we finally said, you know, the, wor the world is warming, but really what we're talking about is climate change. We're really talking about changes in the environment that are going to happen because of the things that we're doing. And uh, so this one is kind of, to me, the greenhouse effect thing. Um, we're talking about pH changing in the ocean caused by man, um, but pH is not really what I consider the biggest problem. If you look at that, uh, that top graph, that shows you the uh, carbon dioxide emissions over time. And uh, we certainly have been uh, increasing the, our emissions. Uh, in some places, it has come down. In other places, it has gone up. Uh, if we look at the world and kind of break it down, you can see that actually in the Americas, it's coming down a little bit. Um, and I, don't, I would love to say it's because we're all so environmentally conscious that we're making the right choices, and I'm hoping that's part of it. The majority of it is because our industrial revolution is pretty much over, and we're just not manufacturing and doing the things that we used to do. If you look at the purple line, I think I have a, a pointer, maybe not. 
If you look at the, uh, at, oh, I don't want to do that. If you look at the purple line, you can see it's shooting straight up. That's China. So, um, and if you look in general, you'll see that the emissions are still going up uh, pretty much all over. Now we can go back and people say, well, how do we know that it's higher now than it was in the past? And we know because we can do ice core data. So this, uh, this study actually was in 1999. I have not seen an ice core data study since then. Um, but they basically went in and they could show uh, where the carbon dioxide levels would have been in the atmosphere at those times. And then you can see, even in the ice core records from 1800 on, you could see it going up. And then the small dots are actual atmospheric uh, measurements that are taken. So when we talk about uh, this uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, typically, it is historically, we believe it's around 250. It varies every year here and there. Um, but currently, we're running about 380. And so most people know that we're burning fossil fuels, that carbon dioxide is increasing, it's getting into the atmosphere. What people don't know is that most of that is being absorbed right into the oceans. And you can, you can show this, uh, it's, it's just simple gas chemistries. If I take this bottle of water and I open it up, it will either release gases or absorb gases based on pressure. And the gases that it will, put, that will absorb in here will be in the same basic proportions as the air. So if we increase the carbon dioxide in the air, that means more carbon dioxide will be absorbed by the water. It's just uh, simple chemistry. So what we're seeing is uh, they think about 30% of it has already been, been taken up and there's a lot more. So even if we stopped CO2 emissions now, there's enough CO2 in the atmosphere that it would continue to absorb into the ocean over time. Everybody knows pH, everybody knows the basics. Uh, seven uh, is neutral, you know, scale is one to 14. The only reason I bring this up, and I really, again, I don't think pH is the biggest problem. I think it's causing other problems. But everybody knows what pH is. But what I want to stress is that pH is a logarithmic scale. So if I tried to talk in terms of concentration of hydrogen and tried to talk with another scientist, we'd be dealing with numbers that are too hard for us to understand. So we made a scale, right? So now it's 1 to 14. Now it's easy for everybody to understand. 7 is neutral. Um, we work at the aquarium, I've seen people say, well, I say, well, the pH is dropping. Yeah, but it only dropped one unit. If it drops one unit, it drops by a constant, it's really a change in tenfold in the hydrogen concentration, okay? So a small change in pH is a big change in what we're actually measuring. If you go from eight to six, that changes two units, that's a hundred times the amount of uh, the concentration. So it cha you're changing it by 10 times 10. So the scale, because it's logarithmic, what I want you guys to realize is that a small change is a big change. Natural seawater levels are at 8.2. I'm not sure that's actually true anymore. Um, they've always been around 8.2. Um, and what we're starting to see is that uh, the, the science that, that we're getting, people are actually, now that this phenomenon is out there and people know about it, there's more and more scientist interest, there's more and more studies being done, and the studies that I've been seeing in the last couple of years are showing they're actually, I think the overall, at least the shallower areas, the inshore areas, are closer to, they're actually under 8.1 in a lot of places now. So they've actually dropped by, by 0.1 to 0.2. And, you know, animals are affected by pH itself sudden changes in that, but again, that's the pH change is not what's going to cause the, it's not a direct relationship with pH. Um, because what really is happening is it's affecting the chemical processes within the ocean. So if we look at, uh, I'm going through a few definitions so that we can chat a little more, uh, but alkalinity is a measure of these bases that are titratable in water. Uh, if you look at fresh water and you look at something like Lake Michigan, why why is Lake Michigan not affected by acid rain, yet if you go to Canada and uh, Maine and areas up there, uh, a lot of their lakes have what they are calling lake acidification, which is not the same thing. Uh, that's caused by acid rain or acid precipitation that gets in there. Now, the reason that Lake Michigan, we don't have the problems is because we have a bedrock of calcium carbonate, which basically buffers the water. So if acid enters, it reacts with the base that's already in the water, more bases will dissolve in uh, into the water from the bedrock. So that's what's going on in a, in a lake situation, typically. And uh, it does happen in the ocean, and you do have uh, uh, 
you do have alkalinity in the ocean. But what we're really looking at is a cycle of carbon. So if you look at the top line, it's a reaction in a sense, it's a cycling. You have carbon dioxide, you have uh, H2CO3 there is the carbonic acid, uh, eight, and you've got a bicarbonate. So if you took baking soda and put it in water and dissolved it, one of the ions you would get is a bicarbonate. And then on the other end, you have a carbonate ion. So that whole system there is in an equilibrium. And you can adjust, you can change the equilibrium by changing the pH or by changing the concentrations of those different things. We use this science in aquariums all the time because we are trying to balance an ocean that is not an ocean, that's an artificial ocean. So we are constantly measuring these different things, adding things in, and getting them to the right levels. This I took out of a, a book by Stephen Spotty who uh, wrote it for the aquarium uh, industry. And it shows that carbon cycling is natural. Carbon cycling happens all the time. Um, really, carbon dioxide itself can, can come from a lot of sources, even volcanic sources. It's not just man. Um, but what we're seeing is a result of man. Um, but the one thing I really want to stress is the very top of that where it says atmospheric exchange of free CO2. That was my example of the, of the water bottle. So you have to have this free ability for the gases to come in and out of the water. And waves and other activity um, break the surface tension of the water and allow these gases to come in and out. But if the CO2 level, this is a normal system, the way we would expect it to be, but if the CO2 level in the atmosphere gets higher, it's definitely going to go into the water, is what I'm trying to stress. So instead of coming out, we're pushing the CO2 into the water uh, at this point. I can tell you we had a, uh, if everybody's familiar with the Shedd Aquarium and has been there, um, we've got the large oceanarium which contain our, our uh, marine mammal collection. For many years, I battled with pH in that system, and we had pH levels, should have been about 8 to 8.2, uh, but they were about 7.6, and could not get that water any higher. We could put buffers in. I could dump baking soda till my head caved in, and you could not get the pH up any higher. It would not go any higher. And the reason it wouldn't go any higher is we had poor gas exchange. So the CO2 that would build up in the water over time, and as it would build up, our pH would drop, and it would change our carbonate chemistry. It's the same situation. When we rebuilt the Oceanarium just a couple years ago, um, I helped some engineers design a way to degas that water, and now we're at eight. In fact, I could take, in the previous system, I could take a sample of water and put it on a pH meter, and it would tell me that it was 7.6, and I could just bubble a little air in there, or let it sit there. I could just let it sit open to the air for an hour, and the pH would go up to 8.2, because the CO2 was allowed to come out. So it just shows uh, what CO2 can do. So everybody has heard that carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide can act as an acid. Um, I could do a simple experiment here. I could take a beaker of seawater, I could put a pH meter in there, I could bubble CO2, and you can watch the pH drop. And that's because we're forming carbonic acid uh, when that gets into the water. But the real deal is looking at a graph like this. And in this graph, the pH is on the bottom, uh, the other axis is just a uh, concentration, it's a fractional log, but just think of it as amount or concentration. And no matter how you look at it, uh, if you're up here in the, in the 8 range, um, you can see your CO2 is pretty much down to nothing. So you can look and follow the CO2 and say, well, if the CO2 goes up in concentration, automatically you see a shift in the uh, carbonate, which is the other blue line going up this way. What is happening is that the CO2 is getting into the water, it's adjusting that carbon cycle, and it's decreasing the amount of carbon that is in the form of carbonates. Okay, so that's CO3, negative 2. So that's what's basically happening. We, we expect this to continue, so over time you're going to see pH continue to drop. You're going to see your CO2 go up because it's... Uh, it's going into the ocean, even though it does eventually equalize, and you're seeing your carbonate levels go down. The reason this is, uh, is important is that uh, the carbonates are what's going to affect most of the organisms that live 
in the oceans, and that's what we're seeing. So at this point, um, carbon dioxide is being absorbed in, the pH is going to drop. It's actually dropping much faster than we had anticipated. Most of the models that I saw 10 years ago said in a couple hundred years we're going to see this dropping. I I'm talking decades now, okay? I'm talking very short periods of time. So we're seeing a decline. Uh, acidity has been... Uh, has been proven uh, in many studies that it's that it's actually increasing or the pH is decreasing, and uh, uh, shifts uh, in the amount of carbonate ions. They the original assumption, and this this would I have 50 percent by the end of the century. I, I'm thinking maybe maybe in 20 years instead now, maybe 30 years from the data that I'm seeing. But but we are seeing a shift, and and they're thinking that they could drop by as much as half. This is going to change what we know as far as ocean life. You're going to have a major alteration in the food web, um, is starting at the plankton level, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, but it's basically re it's a re result of calcareous organisms or animals that take calcium and carbonate and form their skeleton. Okay, so if you think of a coral, if you've seen white coral, which is really dead coral, um, but if you've seen white coral, that pretty white coral is all made out of calcium carbonate. So we're going to see a major loss there. Um, reefs are going to are going to be affected. Coral reefs because they build their skeletons. They're one of the types of animals that will be affected. And uh, you know, reefs do a lot. They're they're really the the habitat where you have the greatest density in, in uh, of different animals and plants and things that live there. They have shown in some recent studies uh, in areas that naturally have CO2 going into the ocean, maybe some underwater volcanic, volcanic activity, that the fish are changing their spawning behavior. They won't spawn in that pH. They won't spawn in those areas. They will go somewhere else. Um, the changes will have a competitive advantage for some. So like jellyfish, you're going to see are going to be increasing. So calcareous animals, again, are things like uh, things you think of like uh, oysters and clams and shrimp and coral, uh, but it also includes this, this uh, electron microscopy picture here is, is uh, microscopic uh, plankton that uses and builds a calcium carbonate skeleton. And as we see uh, in any type of food web, if you break and lose the lower levels, you're going to lose everything that comes up. So this is going to affect animals at, at the very lowest levels. I put in a, a, some models that I, that I pulled off from various papers and such, and I just, not that I want to look at any of these models, I just want to talk about models for a second because we have to be careful. This is where scientists get in trouble um, because we know something's happening, we monitor what's going on, and then what are we going to do? We're going to predict what we think will happen in the future. And if I say in 20 years you're going to see these things change, and then 20 years goes by and they don't change, I'm an idiot. But it's because it was my best guess, and I might change my guess as we go on. So what I want to talk about, about modeling is just realize that that's what they are. And when you see models built and you see predictions by scientists, they are their best guesses of what they think will happen based on the data that they have. And their guesses will change. So don't look them as, at them as fact, um, but look at them uh, for what they are. I'm going to end up here uh, on a note that I hope we'll, we'll pull into Casillas. There are now we are seeing. So for years we talked, for 10 years we've been talking about this and things are going to start happening and 100 years from now and blah, blah, blah. Uh, this, I pulled this one out of an article that was, uh, I think it was Nature. Uh, no, no, it was the Journal of Limnology and Oceanography. And uh, they're already seeing in their farming in the ocean where they're trying to raise things like oysters for the food industry that they're having, in certain areas, they're not, it's not working anymore. They're growing so slow, their shells are deformed, they can't get the juveniles to, to, to grow properly. So we're already seeing changes in the oceans, not just in the wild populations, but in our food sources. Because we're not going to be able to grow these things in the oceans if they can't live in the oceans. Uh, the one on the left was from a study where they actually uh, set up artificial uh, systems like aquariums and actually showed that if they adjusted the pH by CO2 and kept it uh, at a level about 7.8 that they had much slower growth and at some point death from the organisms. I'm going to end with this slide. Um, what can we do about it? Um, I hate to be pessimistic, but uh, I really don't have an answer. There isn't, we can't 
put something in the ocean that's going to take care of this. The only real answer is to reduce our emissions of CO2 and let everything catch up and hope that it's not too late. Um, but if we continue, and as we've seen with our emission levels, uh, I think this is probably going to be uh, eventually an inevitable situation. So I um, hate to leave it on the downer, but Casilla is going to give you all kinds of great stuff you can do to, to make things better, right? <laughs> You, you want to come up? We're doing, we're doing the questions after. And I know that was fast, but I'm only, I was only given 20 minutes, and I did it in 21, so that was pretty good. Is there a mouse? I'll let Casilla deal with the technical stuff. All right, thank Can you guys hear me? Hi. Ellen, thank you for your engaging presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed that. This is such a big issue for me to wrap my head around, and no doubt we're going to be hearing more and more about ocean acidification in the very near future. Um, I want to thank the Chicago Council of Science and Technology for inviting me to be here today, especially Christina for organizing this. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you all, especially during Earth Week. You know, Sunday is Earth Day, and we've been celebrating Earth Week at the aquarium. And I can't really think of any better place to be than right here with you guys right now who are engaged and curious about all sorts of issues. So it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, to um, reintroduce myself, again, my name is Cassia Purpich. I'm the Assistant Director for Great Lakes and Sustainability at Shedd Aquarium. One of the focus areas that I oversee at the aquarium is our Right Bite Sustainable Seafood Program. Now, let's be real here, we're all adults. Who thinks it's really weird that I'm about to talk about seafood, given that the aquarium has this wonderful collection of over 32,000 living animals that are swimming, hanging out? See, okay, <laughs> I get, yeah. Understandable, um, we do a lot of talks, what I'm about to do, and always people are kind of weirded out in the beginning, like, huh, oh, what is going on here? So let me explain a little bit further why SHED chooses to focus on this issue. Now, the mission of SHED is for our animals to connect you to the living world and to inspire you to make a difference. And there are so many different things that we can all do to make a difference in the health of our waters worldwide, whether that's something simple like um, you know, reducing our carbon emissions, maybe riding our bike to work one day or to the grocery store, or turning off the faucet when we brush our teeth, things like that that I'm sure you're familiar with. But another big important thing that we can do is that if you are a seafood lover, who eats fish? Yep, excellent, okay. I'm glad you guys are here. One really important thing that you can do to protect the health of our waters is to choose sustainable seafood. Now that means fish that were caught or farmed in environmentally friendly ways. And my presentation is going to focus on those issues and talk about why some seafood are great choices for the environment and some are not as much so. Um, after we're uh, wrapped up here in the room, you can go outside the two tables right outside the doors are the primary tool that Shed hands out um, at the aquarium, and it's available on our website. It's called our Right Bite Sustainable Seafood Guide. Maybe some of you guys have seen pocket guides like this before. For those who haven't seen this tool, it's a list of seafood that's popularly eaten here in the Midwest, and it's divided into three different categories. We have a green column, maybe you can see. These are our best choices. So these are fish that have an abundant population, and they're caught or farmed in environmentally friendly ways. Yellow, those are good alternatives. These are pretty good choices for seafood, and I would encourage you to pick them if a, a green choice is not available or to your liking. Um, pretty good sustainability-wise, but there might be some issue that needs to be addressed with regard to population or the gear that's being used to catch them, et cetera. And then red is our avoid column, and this is seafood that we recommend saving for special occasions. Either these fish are severely overfished and their population levels are down and there's not a lot hanging out in the ocean there, or the gear that's used to catch or farm them is just so destructive to the environment we need to focus on um, better ways to harvest these fish. So to that end, we have our Right Bite program where we work directly with restaurants and grocery stores and culinary schools and seafood wholesalers to talk about these issues and um, work with them to get more environmentally friendly seafood in place. Who's, who's still weirded out? Anyone? 
All right, good. See, all right, see? Makes more sense, right? So with that, let's dive right in and talk about sustainable seafood and some of the issues that are impacting commercial fishing and fish farming. Okay, well to kick us off, um, I want to highlight an important piece of research that came out in about 2006. A study was done by Dr. Boris Worm of Dalhousie University up in Canada. He's a fisheries scientist. He looked at global fishing data from uh, the last 50 years and found something really disturbing. As you can see, he plotted this data on a graph and he found that over time, less and less we were being able to take out and he sort of extrapolated on that and made the, the very scary prediction that if we continue fishing um, for wild fish um, at current rates as uh, usual, that we would be completely out of wild seafood by 2048. Now for many of us, that is clearly within our lifetime or the lifetime of someone that we care very much about. This is very scary seeing that, you know, millions and millions of people depend on seafood for livelihood, for nutrition, for a source of protein. So this really generated a lot of buzz back in 2006. People were suddenly thinking much more deeply about this issue and wondering what is it that we need to be doing to prevent this from happening. So let's talk about the five key issues that sort of contribute to this concern and learn more about what we can do as seafood consumers to prevent that from happening. Okay. So when we talk about sustainable seafood, the first issue we go into is overfishing, which, you know, very simply put, is taking too many fish out of the ocean at any one given time. You know, the fishing industry has changed so much over the last 50 years in particular. It's not just the guy in the galoshes that you imagine with his hook and line anymore, right? Um, there are larger vessels going out. We have GPS systems that can track schools of fish nets and gear are getting bigger and we're just becoming more efficient. That's, that's what we do. We become more efficient. But if, unfortunately, the cost of that is that we've been taking too many fish out sometimes. Um, alternatively, related to, oh, let me take a step back. So um, globally speaking, it's estimated that about 80% of fisheries around the world are currently being overexploited. That is intense, 80%. Domestically, the number is lower, but still concerning, about 40% of domestic fisheries, um, it's estimated there, are currently overfished. Now, you might be wondering, why is that so different? Um, that's because, you know, here in the United States, we tend to have stronger regulations in place and enforcement mechanisms. We're able to better track and, and manage our fisheries. So it's a very, very broad rule of thumb. By no means is this perfect. We generally recommend to... Um, chefs and grocery stores and whatnot and general consumers that um, one thing that you could look at is choosing um, domestic seafood over imported where possible. By no means are our domestic fisheries perfect, but it's a very broad rule of thumb that you can keep in mind. Um, also contributing to overfishing is catching fish that are juveniles, right? They haven't had a chance to grow up, to become adults and to lay eggs before they're caught from the water. Um, who has heard of um, orange ruffy? You guys? It was a really popular fish probably in the late 80s, early 90s. Who's eaten orange ruffy recently? What? Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not here to judge, but um, who wants to? Okay, so orange ruffy are like this orange, orange fish uh, caught off the coast of Australia, kind of down over that side of the world. Someone throw out a number and tell me how long they think an orange ruffy can live. 12 years. 12 years higher. 20, higher. 30, 30 mm -mm, higher. 62, 62 mm -mm. Okay, 80, I'm gonna stop, okay, 120. Yeah, orange ruffy can live to be between 100 and 120 years old. Incredibly long lived. And they don't even reach adulthood till about 20 to 30 years of age is when they don't start mating and reproducing. So a lot of the orange ruffy that is caught off the coast of Australia, unfortunately, they're juveniles, really. What are the odds that they've been swimming for 20 to 30 years, feeding themselves, defending themselves against predators? Not likely, which is why when you um, grab one of our guides outside there, you'll see the orange ruffy is on the avoid column, partially for that reason, just because they, they need a break. They just need time to to recoup. Mm -hmm. um, we, we often have culinary students that visit the aquarium um, to talk about this issue and we'll actually take them out on the floor and 
Um, I like to uh, run them past our Australian lungfish, Granddad. Now, we don't eat Australian lungfish, but Granddad is the oldest living um, fish in any aquarium, right? So he's been at Shed since 1930. We, we, got, we caught him from the wild in 1930, and so just a few years ago, we celebrated his 80th birthday, but goodness knows how old he really is. So it's a wonderful example of how long-lived some fish can be. Um, swordfish live, can live 30 to 40 years, sharks as well, so it's really surprising. Okay, second issue that we talk about is bycatch. Bycatch is the term we use to refer to all the fish, marine life, plants, debris, whatever, that you catch unintentionally when you're fishing for something else. Does that make sense? So it's estimated that about 25% of fish taken out of the water is bycatch. Now, let me rephrase that for you. One out of four fish taken was caught unintentionally. Want to take a guess what happens to these fish most of the time? You dump it, throw it overboard, right? You might be out you know, fishing specifically for shrimp or tuna or something like that. You want to use your crew's space, energy, you know, boat, whatever, to, to, um, to catch the fish that you're going to be paid for when you get back to the, the dock, right? So um, it's a, a few um, examples where, of fisheries where this is a particular concern. I named shrimp. So um, shrimp are caught, often caught through um, a gear type called bottom trawling, which is like a big net that has weights and it sinks down to the ocean floor because the shrimp are kind of hanging out at the bottom and they drag it across the ocean floor to pick up the shrimp. Can you guys visualize that? Now, of course, as they pull that net up to inspect their catch, not only did they catch shrimp, which is what they were after, but they, they caught everything else that was hanging out at the bottom of the floor, right? So um, Shrimp can uh, bring in anywhere from every one pound of shrimp caught, depending on the region, 10 to 20 pounds of bycatch. It's amazing how, you know, intense that can be. So um, one creative solution that I want to highlight for you that I'm kind of excited is taking, uh, taking you know, wind here is, um, see this picture right here? This is one of those trawl nets, and as you can see, it kind of has a little pocket and opening that a turtle is escaping from, right? So this is called a turtle excluder device. These are required um, for shrimp fishermen here in the United States. It allows um, turtles and other wildlife to escape while shrimp hang out and maintain, they stay in the net, does that make sense? And it lowers the bycatch for um, domestic shrimp considerably. So every one pound of US shrimp, there's only about four pounds or so of bycatch. Another area where um, this is an issue is with some larger pelagic fish, like tuna, um, swordfish. They're caught with a technique called long lining, which is um, kind of imagine miles long a piece of rope. And every few inches, there's a fishing hook. Do, can you guys visualize that? And it kind of sits there and hangs out in the ocean for a couple days. And it catches the fish that you want, the tuna, swordfish, what have you. But of course, baited hooks, thousands of baited hooks in the ocean is going to attract anyone who's hungry for some free breakfast, right? So some seabirds will come on in, you know, some turtles, other things like that. So that, unfortunately, there are issues with bycatch there. So when we work with um, the industry, the culinary community, we often recommend choosing fish that were caught with more selective gear. So hook and line, right? Or harpoon caught, or choosing farm species, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Next issue I want to draw to your attention is habitat destruction. I think I've been hinting at this all along, but um, there are some types of fishing gear that have a less um, positive impact on the environment than other types. And um, the picture on, the, um, on uh, your left here is uh, an area before and after bottom trawling. So remember, bottom trawling is that technique I described where it's a, um, a net that's weighted down to catch shrimp and other um, seafood that hangs out at the bottom of the ocean. You're dragging this net along. It's basically clear cutting the ocean floor. So that was one area before and after. There are some areas in the ocean that are bottom trawled more than 400 times a year. So that's more than once a day that um, a boat's coming through with the trawl nets and it's basically scrape scrape, scrape. And 
if you're not caught, if you're a lucky fish that wasn't caught in the net that day, really, can you, can you survive in that? There goes shelter, food, what have you. Um, another example of um, habitat destruction is over here. This is um, a mangrove forest. I don't know if you guys are familiar with mangroves, but they are these um, trees whose root systems are in the water. It's, uh, we have an exhibit um, for it at the aquarium in our wild reef downstairs. It's a very biodiverse, complex habitat. It supports a lot of wildlife. Um, and they are often found along in coastal areas in Asia, where a lot of shrimp farms are also built. And what happens is, is the shrimp are, like to hang out in that shallow, warm water there. They'll slash and burn those forests in order to set up their shrimp farm. So that's sort of an example of an area before and after. Okay, next issue, aquaculture. So um, aquaculture, obviously I've been talking about a lot of pressures that our wild oceans face in terms of overfishing and bycatch and habitat issues. Um, and aquaculture, fish farming, can be a wonderful alternative to give the oceans a break and sort of alleviate some of these pressures. But that said, not all fish farms are created equally, so I'm gonna briefly describe the two basic systems and uh, talk to you about which one is the more sustainable choice. So there are um, generally two forms of fish farming. There's open system and closed system. So the open system is the one here on the left. Open system, as you can see by this picture, this is um, a salmon farm uh, off the coast of Scotland, I believe. It's basically fish that are in a contained area in an open ocean. Um, now, who had a, like a pet goldfish when they were a kid? Oh yeah, I know, I won one at a carnival once when I was 10. Um, and as we all know, if anyone who has had pet fish, we all know, what do they do? Well, oh yeah. <laughs> yes, they do eventually, yes they do. Um, but they eat and they poop. They eat and they poop, they eat and they poop, and you have to change that poopy wastewater, right? No different when you have a fish farm, except rather than, you know, Goldie in your little fish bowl, you've got hundreds of thousands of um, salmon or whatever, whatever fish you're farming in this contained area in the open ocean. So um, one environmental concern that this poses is that these fish are, they're growing and eating and growing and they are producing a lot of waste, right? And where does that waste go? Kind of flows out into the open ocean. Um, it can have a really negative impact on the habitat in the area. Um, what happens is, is so much waste flows out from the fish farm, and waste itself can be beneficial, right? It, it's a fertilizer, and so what does happen is a lot of algae starts growing around the area. And, but in turn, in this case, oftentimes, there's so much excess waste that so much algae grows, and it starts um, blocking out sunlight and nutrients for the other wild fish that are swimming around in the area, basically suffocating wildlife. Um, fortunately, the, the aquaculture community, they take this issue very seriously, and they're developing a lot of creative solutions that I think are, um, are really promising, and I look forward to seeing where they go with this. So for example, um, to mitigate that issue, one uh, technology that um, some fish farmers are looking into is surrounding this open fish farm with um, oysters and other shellfish. They feed on um, little particles of waste. That's their food. So they kind of like help um, filter, if you will. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see where that goes. Uh, other concerns with open systems. So basically, as I have hinted with waste, what goes in goes out. So if you've got a disease outbreak and you need to put um, some antibiotics into your farm, what's not absorbed by the fish goes out and can impact wild populations. If you're trying to control for that algae growth and you're putting down um, pesticides, fungicides, things like that, um, all those you know, chemical inputs go out and can impact the wild habitat. So when we're working with chefs and grocery stores and seafood lovers like yourself, we tend to recommend the other type of farming, which is closed. As you can see by that picture up there, um, it's a man-made enclosed area. It's just a far more regulated and tightly controlled environment. Um, you're often required to sort of treat the, the, you know, the poopy wastewater that 
you know, arises in those ponds is filtered before it's um, discharged or recirculated back into the farm. Um, and it's just a more stable environment, um, I'd say, in terms of growing fish. So when you look at our little seafood guide here, you'll see some farm species that are on the red side and some that are on the yellow or green side, and often is because are they an open farm or a closed farm? One area of fish farming that I'm really excited about is aquaponics. Have you guys heard of aquaponics? So that is the combination of like this closed fish farm with um, hydroponics, which is growing plants in the water. So um, this picture to the lower um, right-hand corner here is <clears throat> this is lettuce being grown hydroponically, and it's growing because of the, the wastewater that was developed by a tilapia farm is being funneled over to fertilize the greens, which are then being in turn fed to the fish. Isn't that cool? Kind of closes the circle. And actually, that, um, there are a number of farms like that in Illinois. I don't know if you guys knew this, but we have a lot of fish farms in our region. It's a really big industry. OK, almost done. So last and finally, the fifth issue that I want to touch on is IUU, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. So it's basically the pirate fishing that goes on. Um, more so than other food, you know, veggies, poultry, um, eggs, what have you, like the oceans are not easily contained or controlled. Um, you know, our earth is what, three quarters water. Um, each country has its own set of laws determining how they use their water. Um, and most of the water is not owned by any one country. Um, so sticky issues can arise. Um, I, the example that we often share with culinary students is this. We say, let's pretend I am a, I'm a French man and I bought a boat in Australia and then I registered my boat in Guatemala and then I'm fishing off the coast of Sweden. Whose fishing rules do I follow? Japan's. <laughs> Does anyone want to take a guess? Sweden's? It depends. So here's the deal. Um, back in the 80s, the UN had the Law of the Sea Treaty, which um, established this following guideline, that up to 200 miles off your border, you could control. Okay, So you could set the rules for how people take fish. However, mile number 201 and beyond, until you're in someone else's economic zone, is free reign. Um, so if I registered my boat in Guatemala and I'm fishing off the coast of Sweden, if I'm within Sweden's zone, got to follow their rules. But if I'm not, I follow Guatemala's. And Guatemala is one example because uh, I bring up because they're kind of known for having um, more relaxed fishing rules. It's, um, have you guys heard the term to fly a flag of convenience? Um, you, you'll pick to register your boat where there's the, the least red tape involved. So, <clears throat> and that complication with the fact that the fish themselves don't salute a flag and they'll often school and be in and out all over waters um, allow for a lot of um, illegal activity to take place. So this could mean that people are fishing for something um, out of season, you know, illegally or using illegal gear. But um, nobody's really there to regulate because it's just too big of an area to be, to be controlled by a singular entity or what have you. Um, and so it's just something to be aware of because folks that you know, go around the rules that we have in place often undermine the efforts to protect the fisheries um, and you know, will, uh, will not respect the idea of sustainable fishing. So that's just sort of the fifth issue that we touch on. And with that, I know I'm at my time, so I'm gonna stop here. I could rattle on all day, but thank you um, so much for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions. Well, we have time for questions for Alan and, and Cassia. Um, Cassia? Yes. Do you see any solution to the last problem that you just covered? The illegal, unreported, you know, control? I mean, is there any type of community driven for that? So your question is, do I see any solution to the illegal, unreported fishing that I just talked about? Oh, my goodness. Um, 
I wish I could say so, but I don't. The, um, the one thing that we've been working really hard to do is um, to promote the idea of traceability in the seafood industry, kind of in the same way where if you go to a farmer's market here and you buy your veggies um, directly from Farmer Joe or whoever it is, you know who grew those, maybe you visited their farm, things like that. That kind of traceability and transparency doesn't exist as much in the seafood industry. So um, like a lot of, um, there's a lot of different uh, like eco-labeling and certification programs in place that try to track the fish um, from boat to the processor to the distributor, to the retailer, to your plate. Um, and there are some um, that do a really great job managing that process, but that by no means is true for the majority of fish. So just really, um, at a consumer level, ask questions and put the pressure on your vendor to, to make sure that he or she knows about these issues, cares about these issues to say, well, I, I don't have all this information on the label here. Can you tell me where this fish is from? Do you know how it was caught? And um, really do what we can to you know, advocate for traceability in the industry. Um, in front. A question for Alan. Could you compare running water like a creek or a river versus uh, a lake that is not uh, bottomed with uh, calcium carbonate versus the ocean? You know, there's, there's, it's a good question, Rob, and, and I will tell you that there are, um, all of them are absorbing CO2. The, all of them will have some pH change likely as a result of that and a shift in their carbon. The effects that it will have on the organisms that live there is going to vary quite a bit, um, especially if you're looking at, uh, you know, you talk about running water. Uh, running water um, will, you know, it definitely will equalize faster with the gases and that. But, you know, when you look at a, a river, say like the Mississippi here, versus the water in a river, say in the Amazon region, or uh, where I've been doing research, which is in Guyana, um, when you look at the water there, I go to Guyana and the pH is already at six. The conductivity is under 20. It's like distilled water. There's no nutrients in the water. So just the fact that it's in a different place in the world, um, already is very different. So it's kind of hard to compare all running versus all uh, lakes versus uh, oceans. Um, but all of them are going to absorb uh, the CO2. In fact, I would have to say from a chemical standpoint, it would, to me, it would make sense that the fresh water would absorb it even faster. Um, it, because the surface tension is different and there's so few ions in the water that uh, there's more water molecules around to kind of grab them and pull them in. So with, uh, technically, your lakes should be absorbing even faster uh, than, the, uh, than the ocean. Uh, the ocean itself has a, a carbonate cycle and there is a bedrock um, of these things, but as the pH drops, when you get down to about seven, six, the, the calcium carbonate actually starts to dissolve. So this is something that's a real concern. What happens if the pH even drops a little further not only will these animals not be able to, to grow their skeletons, they're just going to just dissolve away. Now, I don't think that's, you know, it's not like you're going to see them fizzing or anything, but um, I'm not sure I answered your question because, it, you know, you, you wanted to talk about the lakes versus the oceans. I think they're all absorbing CO2. I think that what we have data on uh, now is mostly the oceans. Um, I have not seen a, a good study on, uh, on, on the Great Lakes and that yet, and I think it's probably something we should look into. Blue shirt in the back. Mm. Regarding the fishing in the international waters, uh, what percentage does that represent in terms of catch? You know, it's three percent doesn't make a big deal. Ninety-seven percent is very big. Do you have any sense? Um, in terms of illegal fishing, it's at, well. I have a few numbers I can throw at you. So. Um, it's estimated that about one fifth of the global catch comes illegally or just done in ways that, yeah, skirt the system. This also affects us because in the United States, 
the vast majority of our seafood is imported. Although we have a number of wonderful domestic fisheries, about 80% of the seafood we eat comes from outside. You said about one-fifth seems to be illegal. Mm -hmm. What percentage of that is a, what is this international catch? Is that half of it then, or, you know, it's, it's a tremendous amount. I'm just wondering what's the ratio then between proper catching versus illegal catching? Well, just, I've got my, my, my cheat sheet here of notes, and um, I, I would have to go back and check for you, but if um, approximately one-fifth, 20% is caught illegally, then I would hope that 80% is done the right way. Um, yeah. That's a great question. Uh, the last time we saw uh, pH changes this far, we believe, was about uh, um, 65 million years ago. So, so if you go back that far uh, into the Pliocene and that, you will see that they can show that the, that the, the CO2 levels were that high. Um, but the oceans were very different at that time. And what I think we're seeing is that we are going to be shifting back toward those types of oceans. You're going to see a lot of jellyfish and stuff. Um, we're already seeing a lot of jellyfish. Um, and it took us millions of years to evolve into teleost or bony fishes and then to those to evolve into the top predators and all these things. And we're basically taking what took millions and millions and millions of years and we're going to shoot ourselves back to an ocean that was here a long time before we were. And uh, so I don't... Uh, I hate to say I'm a pessimist, I'm more of a, I'm not a pessimist, um, but I do believe that the world has gone through major climate change and has gone through major cycles in the past and it will go through them again. Um, but what we're seeing is that man has been able to exacerbate these situations. Um, a good example besides what we've talked about here is, you, know, you look at Lake Erie, you know, and, and how eutrophic or nutrient rich that lake became. It became eutrophic because we pumped phosphorus and nitrogen and carbon into the system. And we did what would have happened normally, but it would have taken millions of years and we did it in a decade. So yes, you are correct. There have been times when CO2 has been even higher than it is now. It was caused by volcanic activity or other tectonic things. Um, and the oceans were different. I think we are going to see ourselves going back toward those types of oceans. Question for Alan. So will the death of uh, carbonate organ, carbonate organisms like plankton affect the oxygen supply on Earth that higher organisms would survive? I would say no. I mean, not to say that it wouldn't have an effect. I think the effect would probably be minimal. Um, but certainly it's in a balance. If, if you increase one gas, you decrease the other. But the oxygen isn't going to, uh, I, I really don't think you'll see a, a change. And you talk about atmospheric oxygen or even in, within, the, within the water itself. Um, the water can only hold so much gas, and it's going to be in relation to the uh, atmosphere. Um, but I don't, I don't see a, a major change in the oxygen in the atmosphere or in the, in the, in the oceans, actually. There will be some change, but not enough to be significant. Yeah, and there is going to be some effect. So photosynthesis is going to is going to shut down. Um, when those things die, they break down and they use up oxygen. So the first thing you would see is a decrease in the oceans in oxygen levels, um, which would then result in more absorption from the atmosphere into the oceans and less being put into. So I think you could see a change, but I, you know, at this point, I don't think there's enough data to show that uh, we'd see anything that's 
significant. I mean, we're, we're 20% or something. I mean, it's not like we're going to jump to 0% or something. I have a question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> For Castillo. So in your chart where you're, you're classifying fish as, as either green, red, or yellow in terms of how they are with the environment, how do you rate something like tilapia, which is one of the most commonly raised farmed fish? That you know, it's easy to raise. Um, it's probably good in that respect, but it's also introduced into so many areas that it's probably caused the extinction of a lot of native fishes. How do you balance that out when you're charting it as red, green, or yellow? That's a really interesting question. At this time, our program and our research partner, Monterey Bay Aquarium, who produces these um, assessments of the different fisheries and fish farms, doesn't look into that. That's really interesting. So, um, but to elaborate on tilapia ratings specifically, as far as farms go, they're all over the board. So they can be um, in our green category if they're farmed domestically for some of the reasons we talked about in that slide because they're farmed in a closed environment. Yellow, in the yellow column, if they are farmed in, I believe, Central America, and in the red category for the most part, um, with a few exceptions, if they're farmed in Asia. So really practices for tilapia farming specifically vary by region around the world. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add on that, you know, we were, it, and it's a good question. Uh, down in Guyana, we were doing research down there, and we would visit the native villages uh, of the native people that lived down there that they call Amer Indians uh, to distinguish them from East Indians. Um, but the uh, a lot of the, the native people, now we're down there doing fish and water studies, and the fish studies, because it's one of the most, probably the most diverse freshwater area in the entire world. And then you go to the villages, and they're talking about tilapia. Like we'd like to build a we'd like to build a pond and put tilapia in. and and that was the same questions that we had where holy cow if you put tilapia and they got into the river systems and that what's going to happen to this huge biodiversity um, so that's why we we uh, said the you know we do our best to try to get that information but you know you can get burned and I'll tell a story can I tell a story this is a shed story it's a terrible story and it's not even supposed to be out I don't think but I'm going to tell it anyways um, we had uh, we were buying tilapia for our restaurants and we were getting them from what was considered the most sustainable company around. And they had, we had, you know, people had visited, they were doing tilapia, they were raising it, everything was good, and we were buying it from them. And then we found out that they actually got in trouble. And because what they were doing is their volume, the demand had gotten so high that this company actually started buying tilapia that they weren't raising and putting it in their own packaging um, and selling it as their own sustainable stuff. So we don't, you know, we were using this fish because we knew it was so sustainable, and then it turns out that somebody was crooked anyways. So, I mean, that stuff can happen. You do the best you can to try to get the information, but you never know. I mean, in a pre-administrative life, I was an ichthyologist too, and I remember in southern Mexico collecting um, endemic fishes in these little ponds and, and small lakes, and right behind us were the locals dumping tilapia into the ponds, and uh, we knew that, you know, that was the last anybody would see of a lot of those yeah, smaller those fish. fishes we were collecting. This is kind of a question for both of you. Cassia, you talked about um, open ocean farming, and you talked about land-based and circulating systems. How did those two compare in carbon footprint, and also to major So that's is a. There a is, there, is that taken in, in, into consideration with these prices? Is that like part of the. Yeah, so that's definitely, I think, the next big wave when it comes to research and sustainable seafood, because at this time, these ratings do not reflect carbon footprint, but it's very much an emerging you know, concept, n not just in the seafood industry, but I think in a lot of other industries and the way we we do things overall. 
Um, as far as the specific carbon output from a fish farm versus an open ocean farm, I don't have information for you there, Stacy. but that's something I'll look into when I get back to the aquarium. I do know that as far as food miles are concerned, the average um, you know, piece of food on a plate, a strawberry, um, hamburger, whatever, travels an average of 1,500 miles, whereas the average food miles for a seafood that's on your plate travels 6,000. And that, um, you know, regardless of whether it was farmed or wild caught, most cases wild, well, no, I'm not gonna say either farmed or wild caught, but it's often farmed or caught in one place, shipped to Asia for processing, shipped back to the United States to be served as your, um, you know, Alaskan salmon or what have you. And that certainly has a, um, an implication as far as carbon footprint is concerned. So again, Yep, I think, um, you know, as, you know, it's my hope that the seafood industry will become far more transparent over time about, we, you know, we were just talking about this the other day with um, one of my business colleagues. We were talking about um, all foods are now required to have um, a country of origin labeling here in the United States. That regulation passed maybe two years ago or so. So now when you go to the grocery store, you should be able to see where the, um, something was created. But you don't necessarily know where, where it was processed. So... Um, I just, I just want to, I think I heard it on NPR, but I'm not positive. So, but they did a story where they went around the United States to all the grocery chains and the big ones, the ones here, Jewel and Kroger's and everything. And they actually purchased fish and took DNA samples of all those fish and then tried to determine if they were labeled properly. I can't remember the number, but it was something ridiculous. It was like 40% or 25, at least it was 20% of the fish that's labeled in the store is labeled improperly. And this was at regular chains. Now, whether it's just confusion or someone says, I can sell a tilapia for the price of an orange roughy, or I don't know, but even when you're buying what, and you're asking the right questions, it, there is something out there that, you know, you're not always getting what you're paying for. Well, you can't deny the fact that the CO2 is going up. You know, they would say, well, climate change and, and global warming can have other potential side effects. Right? But, but when it comes to the ocean, that's clearly carbon, right? Well, it's clearly carbon dioxide that's entering, you know. I mean, whether the carbon di and I mean, we know that that most of the carbon dioxide, the reason it's going up in the atmosphere and the reason it's so high is because of our emissions. I, I believe so, um, but I also believe the same with climate change. So to me, they're one and the same. But they, I, I haven't seen denial on, on ocean acidification. Uh, most people don't know anything about it yet, so they'll deny it. You know, we all we. It's part of our. It's your belief system. You know, if you believe something, it doesn't matter what facts I show you. You already believe something else. It's hard to change someone's mind. So. I, I don't understand how we can, and in fact, I, I used to have a slide in this presentation, some of them where I just said, no more discussion. I don't, I don't even want to discuss whether this is happening or not. It's happening. And there's so much evidence at this point that I, I, I think those that are the retractors and those that are arguing against it, I don't even want to talk to them. <laughs> the person in front. Yes, and then the gentleman behind you was after you. Um, well, as for bacteria, n no idea there, since I, um, we have an, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, my answer to that is is uh, it's more of a hobby. Um, and, and I'll tell you what, if if you if you ever go get a chance and see some of these farms that are close by, um, that are doing it and actually making money and producing, it's not easy. It's very difficult. And when you're doing fish farming, it's different than a koi pond in your backyard. A koi pond is a hobby, and you can maintain 10 koi and 1,000 gallons or a couple thousand gallons or whatever, and you can have a nice little pond. But if you're trying to produce food fish, you're typically, it's an intensive, it's a heavy load. There's a lot of load. There's a lot of what we call bio load on the system. And it's not that anybody can do it. I, you know, I know a lot about it, and I've read a lot of books, and I wouldn't try to start a fish farm right now. I just might have to respectfully disagree with my colleague. <laughs> um, so to follow up on your question as well, um, you know, whether or not it's perceived as a hobby, I think it's very quickly, if not already, becoming a reality. There's a lot of cool examples in Chicago. We have, um, there's uh, the, this new uh, group called The Plant, which is, uh, they built this uh, aquaponics system in like an old warehouse on the west side. Um, I read a clip a few months ago that they were thinking about, um, the city had uh, s was thinking about taking an old building um, somewhere up in the uptown neighborhood and converting it to a fish farm. There's another great example is um, Growing Power. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, so, if it is a hobby, as Alan thinks that it is, like I said, it's quickly going to need to become an industry because, you know, I talked about a lot of the pressures we currently have on our wild fisheries, and it's really clear that fish farming is the future. And at this time, about half of the seafood um, that's produced is farmed now, and that number is only going to go up. So, um, you know, and I mentioned some of the innovative things that the fish farmers are doing to sort of address the environmental concerns that I raised, and, you know, maybe some of these smaller urban aquaponics facilities are one way to go, at least in our region. It's really, it's really promising, I think, actually. Another gentleman behind you. Good question. <clears throat> For myself, I think that my responsibility is to come here and to get out and talk to talk to the press. And, and I think Casilla is probably the same way. You know, it's awareness at this point for us. Um, you know, our job is to try to get everybody aware of what's happening. Um, we certainly should be um, advocating for certain public policies, and we do. But I look at all of you and I say, every one of you has a vote just like I have a vote. And it's really not up to us. It's up to us to get everybody aware of what's happening. It's up to everyone to get the right people in there who are going to do uh, and listen to the scientists. And then, um, you know, on my side of the house with fisheries and fish farming issues, when you ask what can scientists do, I guess I would open that more to anyone. What can anyone do, whether you're a scientist or not? And that's if you eat, if you enjoy fish, if you go to grocery stores or restaurants, I'm pretty sure we all do. Um, you know, take one of these cards or do some more research online to dig in deeper on these issues. And like I said earlier, don't be afraid to ask those questions. If you don't have enough product information in a menu or on a grocery store label to determine, um, you know, where something was from or how it was caught in order to make the judgment for yourself, don't be shy. You know, speak up and ask those questions. Um, as far as legislation is concerned, something really cool that's happening um, recently, right now, the, um, you know, the Illinois uh, uh, how, um, House and Congress are currently um, uh, in the process of voting on a bill that would ban shark finning or shark fins in Illinois, which is really exciting. Um, it's passed the House, and it's currently in the Senate. So um, if you follow what's going on in Springfield, you can keep your eyes peeled for, for that bill um, in the Senate. And when it comes time to vote on that, you know, call your, your congressman and, and uh, advocate for it.
could have been. I don't know. I'm sure I heard about it. I'm not positive. As far as, so should we just stop eating wild seafood? I mean, plain and simple. You know, talk about sustainable, whatever. But to, I mean, if by 2048, the fish, you know, are going to be gone. That's a great question. He said, should we stop eating wild seafood? And if you, if seafood is part of your diet, I realize it's not part of everyone's, but if it is, the answer is no. Do not stop eating wild seafood. Start eating wild seafood that comes from sustainable fisheries. Um, you know, I, I only had 20 minutes for my presentation today, but if I'd had more time, I would have um, talked to you guys a little bit more about um, what's called fishery improvement projects, fishery improvement projects, FIPS, we call them for short. And these, um, it's kind of this new trend, very promising in the seafood industry where a lot of the fish that are, have been traditionally overfished, the fishermen are banding together to redevelop their management plan of that resource so that from here on out, it's responsibly managed and harvested by them in a responsible manner. The great example that comes to my mind is um, red snapper down in the Gulf of Mexico. So it, when you go out there and you pick up one of our cards, you'll see red snapper is on the red column right now. But like I said, these fishermen, because it's traditionally been overfished kind of derby style where it's like, take all you can, every man for himself. But the dynamic between the fishermen has since changed where they realize that if they want to keep fishing, because a lot of these guys have been doing it for generations, you know, their great, 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 great grandpa was a fisher and passed on the trade, you know, to their son, to the son, to the son. They realize that in order to protect their own livelihood, that they need to really team up and, um, you know, be more strategic in how they go out for red snapper. So, and, uh, um, you know, at Shed, we have um, kind of information about that on our website and and so I would say one of the best things that you can do that really sends a very loud and clear message is to vote with your fork, essentially, and choose to support the ones that are doing the right thing or have made this public statement that says, we're in the process of doing the right thing and we're working with the World Wildlife Fund on da 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 da, -da because the, um, the other folks take note and make changes. So I would say if you enjoy eating seafood, keep on and keep asking those questions. Yeah, we, this is Stacy. Stacy is a, a professional in the seafood industry here in Chicago. I work for a seafood company here in Chicago, and actually, our um, for the next two months, every pound of red snapper that we sell, we work with the association that uh, Tracy is talking about. Where for every pound of, of red snapper that we sell during the next couple of months, we donate a percentage of the profit back to the fishermen to these fishery improvement projects. If we don't support these fishermen who are doing it and it's their livelihood and their job and they're trying to do it the right way, then they're out of a job, their family's out of you know money, you know, they're out of their occupation, essentially. Their livelihood is gone and they're trying hard to do it the right way and to make sure that they continually have more fish to sell to people, to restaurants and to everyone throughout their lives and that their kids can also take voting with your fork, making the right decisions, informed decisions, like asking the customers. A lot of restaurants in the Chicagoland area, if they don't, if your server doesn't know the question, they'll go right back to the chef. The chef doesn't know the question, the chef calls them. You know, where they got their seafood from. You, if you ask enough, you will get an answer. And so related to that, it's not just the consumers who are voting with their forks, but it's also major big time corporations. So I want to highlight as one example, Walmart. After that study came out in 2006 where they said we'd be out of wild seafood by 2048 if we continue business as usual, Walmart was just like, oh my gosh, this cannot happen. We have so many thousands of stores, so many millions of customers. We need a steady supply of seafood or this is bad news for us. So they publicly stepped up in 2006 and said, I think it was by like maybe by 2014 that all the seafood in their stores, the kind of fish sticks, salmon burgers, what have you, would be sustainably sourced. Now, when Walmart makes a commitment like that, basically everyone who's been supplying to Walmart, if they want to keep Walmart's business and that lucrative contract that's in place, they're going to shift course ASAP. So that's been exciting. And um, the, uh, about 15 of the top 20 retailers uh, in the United States currently have similar sustainable seafood commitments where they are sort of going through their supply chains right now and have made these um, commitments to you by, you know, 2015, 2016 to um, phase out what's unsustainable. And if 
you know, as Stacy's saying, if you're the producer, the fisherman, the processor, whatever that wants to stay in business, you're going to shift course and um, look for more sustainable solutions. They don't have to, these restaurants, they don't have to publicly say where they need. Is there like a, an app or a website where, um, I, I can't imagine every restaurant knows where their fish are. I just imagine there's some restaurant owners, managers, don't really care. They just want to get fish. So, um, you know, you talk about increased transparency. Um, Well, it's a lively discussion here. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we're on the right track here in the United States. Actually, I will say in Western Europe, they're arguably more advanced over there. Uh, currently, all the McDonald's in, in um, Western Europe are required. Their filet -O fish sandwich is required to come from a sustainable source in McDonald's. I'd say really the last frontier as far as sustainable seafood is concerned is over in Asia, You know, where seafood is a really big part of the culture and of their diet. Um, and there's a lot of sensitivities there. Um, but very slowly but surely, we're starting to collaborate um, with that side of the globe and just sort of have those basic conversations. I'll actually be attending a conference in Hong Kong later this fall, and it's going to be wonderful to sort of meet folks over there and, and sort of feel things out and uh, see what work needs to be done to work cooperatively and respectively with the community over there. Well, Alan and Cassia, thank you for some wonderful presentations tonight.